All right, friends, we're going to do a special podcast today. We're going to call this 90% Mental because that's just what we called it. And this is my friend, Dr. David Klonsky. David is a professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia. If you've heard me sort of talk about sort of my research into combat sports psychology, you probably heard me reference my friend David. And uh, he and I uh, are undertaking writing a book together. The, and the working title is 90% Mental. And it's going very slowly because we get together when we get a chance. He happens to be in Toronto. So, uh, David, it's good to see you, my friend. Good to be here. And yeah. what, what are you doing? So a quick background. David is a martial artist. He had an amateur mixed martial arts fight. He's a black belt in karate. He studies Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And he's a professor of psychology. So he's part of my super team of... Uh, uh, that I kind of, my crew that I work with studying combat sports psychology. And we're friends. We went out and got drunk last night. It was very fun. So what are you doing in town? Uh, there is a small group of suicide researchers meeting, trying to form a neurobiology of suicide sort of research group, uh, in, an international one. So, so you get to come to Toronto, go out with your friend on... Uh, one night, have a few beers and eat some food. And yeah, then... my, my first thought is like, hey, Toronto, Robin's <laughs> yeah, there. Exactly. <laughs> and so we are, we have been trying to chart some of our writing in real time as we work it out on the internet. Uh, so we've, we've thrown a few podcasts together. This one, he happens to be in town. So we're doing it here at Fight Network. It's going to be an ongoing thing. But when we hang out, we start working on the book a little bit. But then we kind of wander into whatever we want to talk about in combat sports and psychology. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is the idea that uh, John Jones is fighting Daniel Cormier. Cormier, it's a rematch, and Cormier is the champ, but Jones won last time. What's your thoughts psychologically, mindset, the things that are going through each of these guys' minds? Yeah, I mean, my bias when there's a rematch... Uh, after a competitive fight, which you know, I think the, yeah. the first one was competitive, is that the advantage is to the guy who lost because he can feel like, you know what, I had my moments and I can change this and that. And mm. you know, can, that, that guy can have a clear, clear way forward. So I think Cormier is sort of thinking along those lines. Like, yeah. I learned from that. I know what I did wrong. I know what I can do right. I'm going to be better. In I know I'm close. Yeah. yeah. And, and I can identify some specific things to do better. And then he can go in feeling confident that he can execute that. Jones is in sort of a weird position. He won the first time. It was convincing, although it wasn't dominant. And it's not exactly clear what he should change. He also hasn't fought since then. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's a, you know, I'd say that the situation is slightly more in Corm Cormier's favor, although uh, Jones has the advantage of being better. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a good yeah. place to start. Yeah. Well, he won, number one. And uh, this is an interesting thought, too. He looks at it and goes, I beat that guy not at my best. I was doing coke. I was doing blow in Brazil three weeks out from that, training at a low level, getting high, all those kinds of things that he knows he did. Now he's putting in more work than he ever put in. So he's got to be sitting there going, I'm more John Jones than I was last time. He definitely could. But the, you know, we talked briefly about self-handicapping yesterday and you know, John Jones actually talked mm -hmm. about that. I think it was an Instagram mm -hmm. post recently, how he, he always was fighting knowing he didn't prepare the best. And that kind of took some pressure off of him right. because if he lost, you right. know, no, no big deal. So now he is, you know, according to what he's saying, mm -hmm. you know, doing this for real. Who knows that, that that can make him feel more confident or it can make him feel like, what if I fail under these circumstances? He's never shown mental weakness, you know, in the cage in the past. So mm -hmm. I'd, I'd be surprised uh, that, you know, we didn't know that for sure until his fight with uh, Gus. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he was a warrior. Yeah. So I suspect he'll be fine. But... It, yeah, I could see that particular thing you brought up going either way for him. You and I have talked before, and Mullins and I have talked, and there's mm -hmm. certain fighters that we kind of identified in sort of 2000, um, 2014, 2015 as kind of the mental giants. But the game shifts so much. The pressures change. Everybody's understanding of getting into the state they need to get in changes. And now Ronda, who looked like a mental giant, collapsed in her fight. Conor McGregor, who was operating at a level of freedom in fights, didn't do that in his last fight. Weidman, who seemed mentally unbreakable, seems now to have been affected by uh, Rockhold. Like, we're seeing that. And the, the last remaining guys in that sort of two years ago in the setting were uh, uh, 
uh, Demetrius Johnson, who is on the poster behind you, mm -hmm. and John Jones, who is on the poster behind you. And we're going to see them both fight. They're the last remaining kind of mental giants of that developmental era. You know, it's going to be very interesting to see because as things change, if you're a really good boxer, but the level of boxing comes up, you become an average boxer. You're a really good mental giant, and the level of mental gigantism comes up and you become an average mental fighter. Yeah, that's really interesting. I was sort of seeing it a little bit different uh, in that, um, so we saw GSP and Anderson mm -hmm. Silva burn out, yeah. but it took them a long mm -hmm. time to get there. Uh, but they were clearly, you know, both showing signs of like mentally being done yeah. before, they, uh, in before their last fights. And, you know, with Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor, they were so under the lights in ways mm -hmm. that GSP and, and, and uh, the spider weren't. That I, I remember thinking, like, are these guys who are amazing? Are they going to burn out quicker? Right. And yeah, and maybe they did a little bit, and maybe maybe not burn out all the way, but enough that they, you know, they weren't those mm -hmm. mental giants. Uh, where some of these other, like Demetrius Johnson, doesn't have the same spotlight. In some ways, that's unfair. Yeah, um, but in other ways, maybe that's it, good. But, right. In other ways, maybe it helps. But it's protective and allows them to last longer. And you know, maybe that's why I'm, I hadn't thought about why I've been necessarily losing that mental edge. Obviously, he lost to Rockhold. Mm -hmm. I don't know, they said he was injured, but Rockhold was also had a bad mm. camp. It's hard to know what to make of that. So the, the, the rematch will be interesting just to see what the mental approach is. Weidman seems stressed outside of the cage. He seemed going into it, and he seems it now. There's certain excuses. Huh. There's, uh, you know, oh, that was a fluke. He kind of gets emotional. Not that that's necessarily bad. Michael Bisping has made that work for him. Lots of people do. But... It's out of character. It's a change, right? Yeah. It's a change. The I mean, way he was fighting Anderson Silva is this guy is, I'm, Lu I'm um, Chris Weidman. Right. I will beat any man. I'm going to beat him twice. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And now he seems distressed. But that's interesting. an interesting thought. So imagine, let's just say George and Anderson, it's 10 years. And it wasn't 10 years of being that big, but it was 10, let's call it 10 years. Mm -hmm. In those 10 years, let's say it takes 100 to get a hundred whatever fantasy um, uh, points to get to burnout. 10 a year or five a year for the first five and then 75 in the next five. A right. hundred, you're done, whatever it is. Right. These guys get it in two years. Ronda gets a hundred in two years. Connor gets a hundred in two years right. and it mentally burns them out. That's a very interesting thing because you see them crack and I don't care who you are, to go from just some kid in Memphis to Elvis Presley is going to shock you. It's going to burn you out. It's going to be traumatic as, and that's what Ronda did and that's what Connor did. They went from regular people yeah. to elite superstars under unbelievable amounts of pressure. And Connor may have still, you know, overcome a lot of other fighters, but you know, one of Nate Diaz's really cool qualities is he just doesn't break. Yeah. He's just there to fight. Yeah. You can hit him a hundred times and he just tells you to bring it on. And so it was an interesting combination. You know, McGregor has been, you know, in some way or another, breaking his opponents mentally, mm -hmm. sometimes before the fight, sometimes during the fight, sometimes both. And he had a lot of success against Diaz in that first round. He probably was expecting, you know, all right, here it's going to happen yeah. again. He's going to fold. You know, Diaz hits him yeah. with one shot, raises his arms in yeah. the air. And, and it happens at the moment where you go, oh, shit, he's going up and I'm somewhere down here physically, mentally, yeah. uh, breathing, uh, exhaustion. Yeah. Diaz, now that we've had the time to look back at it, People are not giving Nate Diaz enough credit. I think a lot of people are, but there's so much, that guy sucks, see, he was inflated, that it takes away from Diaz. When you really look at that fight, look at him asking for the fight. You know those guys were beaten before they even got in the cage with you. He identified that mm -hmm. after the win over Michael Johnson in the first time he spoke about it. Nate Diaz was aware the whole time, this, you break these guys mentally, you're not gonna break me. Go back and watch that interview. He says it then. Being that aware of it all the way through it, then in the thing, he was maybe, he doesn't like sitting at a desk while people ask him stupid no, questions, he but he did it. He doesn't like being interviewed by CNBC, <laughs> but he did it. He doesn't like all that nonsense, but he did it. Those interviews were yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I watched some of those three, four, five <laughs> times. You know, on the surface, it looks like Conor McGregor was just wiping the floor with yeah. him because he's got this you know, Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. way of speaking. Mm -hmm. Nate Diaz doesn't quite have that. But if you listen to what Nate Diaz was saying, he was, you know, take, taking some, giving some real nice mental counter shots. Yeah. You know, you've only beaten, you know, midgets. Yeah. You haven't beaten a real size yeah. person. I don't care about belts. Um, then why do you watch that one back? I don't care about belts. Then why do you bring it around with you all the time? And, and Connor looks, 
looks at it. He hit him. He he hit him with that. It uh, Diaz won that fight in many different ways, and uh, it it was his breakout moment. And uh, it's a shame if people don't give him. I think I think people get it. There's no doubt. He smashed that guy in the face. He fell down to the ground and he choked him. You get that. You see that. That's undeniable. But I don't think they gave him the credit. It's like, see, that guy wasn't that. Uh, Nate Diaz took all of that guy's mental attacks, either dodged them or took them on the chin, gave them back until he he broke him. It it was absolutely yeah, it was mind-blowingly fascinating in retrospect. And... Uh, and shocking, you know, because you were everybody. I was sure that Ronda was a mental giant. I was sure that Weidman was, and they were in those moments. But you aren't just by definition mentally a giant or mentally strong or any of those things. You are that right. as a byproduct of insane hard work. And whatever the reason is, because you're burnt out or you get pulled in different directions or you lose your focus, but whatever the reason is, you remove the work and Rhonda's like, well, screw it, I'm Rhonda Rousey. That was good enough for Betch Cohea. That, 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 was, that was enough for her to beat her. It wasn't enough to beat Holly Holm. And then, boom, she recognizes, oh my God, I'm not Rhonda Rousey. And she recognized that it looked like it's... in the day, yeah, days or weeks it's... leading up to yeah. it. So she was already looking yeah. a little bit shaky and then, yeah. but you have no choice, you gotta show up and she, mm -hmm. You know, in some ways, I give her credit in that she really did stick to her sort of, you know, fight philosophy and fight mm. toughness. She kept coming forward. It was the wrong strategy. Yeah. It was like throwing batting practice fastballs yeah. to, to like a power hitter. You know, even in batting practice, if you at least throw the ball at a different speed a couple mm -hmm. times, it makes it a little bit harder. But yeah. she kept straight, yeah. coming straight at Holly Holm. Just like McGregor did. Same, same left hand, left hand, yeah. left hand. Well, you know, he was yeah. landing at yeah. though, McGregor. Yeah. I think he kept waiting for, mm -hmm. for Diaz to fall. Diaz affected him. So it's like when you go and you say, well, he was throwing too hard. Uh, we were talking about this last night. Uh, precision, be uh, t uh, t uh, timing beats speed and precision beats power. Right. Conor McGregor's slogan. Yeah, his slogan. Yet, Diaz's precision beat McGregor's attempt at power. Diaz be Diaz's timing beat McGregor's attempt at speed. McGregor broke those his own rules, but it's not, people are always like, well, you're making excuses. You have to understand Diaz did that to him. Right. It's like when, when people are like, well, McGregor was tired. Diaz did that to him. Well, McGregor couldn't, you know, was throwing too hard. Diaz made that happen. You, um, people, I think, sometimes don't get that whatever your excuse for, for losing, whatever you did wrong, was created in the environment in which I did right. So all the, the credit for that fight, that is a fight that should define Diaz as reaching another level. Or maybe not. Maybe he's always been, I mean, he has always been this good. I think it's he's just certain things suit him better. Yeah. You know, we, we put him in a category of top five or top 10-ish, yeah. but he won't be elite. And in some ways that was who he was a couple of years ago. But you know, I think people expected his fight against Michael Johnson to be like Michael Johnson's stepping stone to sort of you know break hundred percent. Everybody thought and that. And that's not what happened. Yeah. So it's you know, at that well, what, you know, what do we make of that? Is he really better than, yeah. than we or thought? Or is Don Johnson overhyped? Yeah, because that's the right. really weird one. That to me seems that we can't accept change or gray area. Michael Johnson is a phenomenal fighter. Right. Michael Johnson is a 99.99% fighter, 9999 if you take all human beings, fighter Absolutely. in the world. The fact that Diaz is able to beat him that night isn't like, well, he had an off night or he sucks or he's overhyped. He is that good. But these guys are evolving. And Nate Diaz has always been psychologically strong, but built in fire. He doesn't go sit on a couch with some guy, you know, dog, tell me about your mother. Like, he doesn't do that. This has happened through environment. He's made the right uh, uh, coping adjustments to be a brilliant fighter. It's it's wild to watch the guys who do it without, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe Diaz secretly has, you know, certain books that he's, that he's looking through and he's studying how to do it, but I don't think so. I think it's through adaptations in the fire, in life. And he had the right mental game plan going in. You could hear that based on the, you know, both pre and post fight interviews. You know, after, after the fight, he's talking about how I knew I'd start slow in the first round. I didn't have a yeah. camp, I didn't have a lot of sparring. Yeah. I knew I would get hit, 
but I knew that I would also, you know, yeah. get a feel for what's going on. And, you know, so he, he didn't just win because he's a, a fighter who goes on the autopilot mm-hmm. and then yeah. you know, doesn't go down and eventually wins. He also was there mentally in ways where I think people weren't ready to give him credit. Yeah, that was, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, but, uh, you were seeing that kind of evolution because now you look and you go, and we've seen it before. It's like, oh my God, this guy's wrestling is so good he can't be beat. And then somebody's wrestling is better or somebody makes it not about wrestling and wins. Now, everybody is really good. Everybody has all these skills. Not everybody, but the top 10 are. So it's gonna be the guy who can overcome, who can, who can push his will. These are real things. Um, and somebody who will be the mental champion. Somebody else is going to beat him soon. Somebody else is going to adapt. Somebody else is going to not uh, flounder. I mean, if you were studying how to be just the psychology of how Diaz won that fight and you had to fight him, you have to deal with the fact we can't go too fast now. We can't right. go too powerful now. We can't headhunt. We have to win in the later rounds. You can, we right. have to smash You can up have success for two or three rounds but yeah. not win yet. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that's a hard thing to prepare mm. for. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. So um, uh, we've, we've been talking about tr- uh, trying to write this book. And the last conversation that we had was maybe to explore some of these mental ideas through um, stories. Mm-hmm. So, and I think the last time we were talking was probably about that idea. It was right after Rhonda was beaten. Mm-hmm. If we look back, we could we could... Um, study some of these concepts. So, you know, if we were to write something, well, we want to talk about, you know, how you prepare. We want to talk about overcoming adversity, whatever the topics are, whatever those are, we can study those through the stories of these people. And I think some of these people that were, not we thought were, they were mentally superior in battle until one day they weren't. And studying their journey a little bit might be interesting. When Rhonda saunters in there and beats the best in the world. And then that Betch Cohea fight, which really was her on some level, knowing that she wasn't Ronda Rousey anymore, but she was still good enough to beat some girl like this, who realistically, when you look at her on the bag, was not a top 10 fighter. She just hadn't been defeated, but she hadn't really shown the skill set. She could beat her and then face with somebody else and kind of explore her journey. Conor McGregor loses a fight, destroys everybody, gets signed by the UFC, makes a giant splash, KOs everybody, injures his knee and wins a fight, smashes up Mendez, a top three guy on a few days, knocks out the pound for pound grade in 13 seconds, and then is beaten psychologically and physically by another guy. And I think maybe some of the journeys of these people exploring that can give us insight into some of these topics that we want to look at. Yeah, for sure. And and I mean, something you were saying a moment ago also resonates about how it's not just that you're sort of mentally tough and you bring that with you you know, mental toughness or whatever you call it, mm-hmm. mental preparation, it intersects with a lot of other things, including training. And, physical and ha- preparation. Yeah, physical preparation. Yeah. And so, you know, when McGregor was almost calling his shots, here's how the fight's uh-huh. going to end, Aldo's going to overextend, and I'm going to counter, and then, then it happens. Yeah. It's not just because he's become the, a powerful magician at visualization. Mm-hmm. He's visualizing in a correct and intelligent yeah. way how his strengths match up mm-hmm. to Aldo's weaknesses mm-hmm. Uh, um, assessing what the pressure that he does may do to this guy, correctly assessing mm -hmm. how he's responding to all of those things, Mm -hmm. uh, building movement based on studying. All of those are real physical, technical, strategic, um, you know, things. And evolve, you know, having a a perspective on how the MMA game is evolving and how I'm evolving to stay ahead. You know, that's that's both accurate, but also involves tremendous you know, work ethic yeah. and, and physical training. Outworking and, everybody. And those and, and these can be separable pieces. You don't necessarily have all of them at the same time. Mm-hmm. And so I think one example that may have happened with, with Rousey is, on the one hand, you know, all right, so she already brings in a, a tremendous competitor, um, you know, ready to fight when it's time to fight, and that stuff, which maybe she does bring with her. But what about her game evolving over time? Mm-hmm. We, we did see her adding striking, but it was with a coach who arguably wasn't the best coach to work with, yeah. who made her look really good on pads and 
not necessarily really good against Betch Gohea, but good enough. Good enough. Against a girl who'd been striking yeah. for three years. Who'd Rousey, been an athlete for three years. Yeah. I mean, Rousey actually looks sloppy at times striking yeah. against Gohea. She got hit times. a bunch of times. Her yeah. face was all marked up in a minute right. against a girl who's not an elite striker. Right. So And so what got... One thing that got exposed against Holly Holm is Rousey never evolved her method of closing the mm-hmm. distance. It was always yeah. walk straight forward. And so that did not evolve over the course of the years. It was walk straight forward, eat a couple shots yeah. if you have to, and grab. And, yeah. and that got exposed. And so I would say it that, worked before. Right. It worked before. And I. What I expected leading up to the Holly Holm fight was I was envisioning Rousey's training camp as being some version of working on two or three different ways to close the distance mm-hmm. just to have options so yeah. Holly Holm can you know, it's not like Rhonda sitting on a tee, uh, but yeah. that's exactly what happened. Yeah. So I feel like that's the particular mental area that Rousey went wrong on, probably realized mm-hmm. about a week or so before Which the fight. Which started cracking problem. some yes, of the other foundations. Exactly, yeah. started cracking some of the other. Um, so it's a really interesting example of how these different things intersect. And, and if you, you can miss one and have the other, she was still very tough in that fight. Yeah. She did not back down. Rousey kept coming forward because it was the only way she knew, but she didn't have... The, the mental tools and preparation to, for, to allow that to succeed. Well, that I'm going to push forward and get what I want no matter what mm-hmm. is what worked for her. Mm-hmm. Now, we'll talk about the coaching for a second and we don't have all the insight, but we gather what evidence we can gather by video, watching her performance, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all we can do because we don't see the coaching every day. But a couple of things on that. One is before we get into that, we, if somebody's like, well, you blame the coach or we blame the preparation or was injured, no matter what any of these things are, to grow, you must blame yourself. You must find the area that you were at fault. Mm-hmm. Because if you say, well, it was my coach's fault. Why is that your fault? You need to, tr- it is reliant on you to study enough to assess him. You're the boss. Mm-hmm. You must assess him properly, which I think is what she was doing as she started to fade. She was assessing the situation and going, and people were talking, saying, and in my breakdown that I, was my first UFC breakdown, home will strike to get further away. Then she'll try to kick her in the head. She literally said that to Jimmy Fallon or Kimmel. I don't remember right, which right. Jimmy it was. But I'm not going to let it happen. Yeah, but exactly. She, it was, but it she, was her. she understood that was the problem. Right. Why would that come to you? Because as you think about it, you would go, well, she can't do that because I have system A, B, C, and D to, over, to beat that. What right. she had to go to was, holy shit, that could be real. Well, I'm Ronda Rousey. I'll just overcome. Mm-hmm. I'm Ronda Rousey. I will overcome is not a plan. It's a self-belief that is no longer based in evidence. Your self-belief must be based in evidence. I know that I have the tools. So if the problem is I may not be able to do that, why not? My coach isn't teaching me that. Fire your fucking coach. Or tell him what you need to do and give him a chance to do it. Or address the situation or discuss it. You're the boss. It is not his fault. In this place, if I'm bad at my job, that is my boss's fault. And... Although realistically, if I want to grow, it's my fault. But he needs to take responsibility for it too because he put me in this spot. She put him in that spot. And from that perspective, no matter whatever goes wrong in anything in fighting or in anything in your life, if you find what you did wrong, you can fix it. You know, definitely, and you know, you look at someone like Conor McGregor, and he he does have his own sense of you know, how mm-hmm. he needs to be, what's happening yeah. in the field. He would have noticed if he was working with a, you know a striking coach mm-hmm. who is teaching him very limited skills that worked well against pads. And so, yeah, I, I definitely see it as part part of Rousey's responsibility. I feel like she should have known because she's she's brilliant that she should have known leading up to the fight. I should have more than one way to close the distance. Yeah, I should have I, ten I, ways. I just took that for granted yeah. that of course she would have more than one way. Of yeah. course, if one way didn't work, uh, and and you know people have made a big deal of the cornering advice as they should have. If he had just said do something different, yeah, that would have been more helpful. To than which what he was she saying. would might if her response was like what, then that was in the preparation. If I don't have a something different, that goes all the way back for a long time. But you know. Success can lead to failure because she was successfully able to just Ronda Rousey her way until right. she got a hold of somebody. And you saw that will against Holly Holm. Holm threw a punch and she baseball bat grabbed the wrist. I don't remember ever seeing that in real time. Right. That was her will. I need to get a hold of this person. Mm-hmm. F- laser focus. I mean, watch hundreds of fights. You will never see somebody baseball bat grab the wrist of somebody mid-punch. It was very rare. That shows her mental strength. But 
Same thing with McGregor. In his case, it is 100% his fault because his failures were not systemic. His failures were his movement and his psychology. And those were his great strengths before. So right. whatever he did in preparation or not underestimating what Diaz was capable of doing to ruin those systems. He needs, anybody needs to look back um, and find your fault. Because if, if you find your flaw and repair it, it's not a loss, it's a learning. Well, visualization and anticipation were, were you know, among his strengths. He would be through intelligence, but then also through will and, and other you know, abilities, he could visualize how the fight would go and it would go and he would win. And I actually suspect that the first round was reasonably close yeah. to his visualization, maybe un, un, overextending yeah. a little bit, but it probably went about how he expected. Mm -hmm. But then Diaz was still there in the second mm -hmm. round and then got stronger and he probably didn't visualize that mm -hmm. and he wasn't ready for it. Um, I've heard some people advocate, you know, when you visualize in, uh, in advance for a fight, you can do like a visualization sandwich where you, uh, you visualize it going well the way you yeah. want. Then you visualize it adverse positions and you visualize it going wrong and you coming back from right. it. And then you conclude by visualizing it, yeah. you know, the, your game plan yeah. works, it goes the right yeah. way. But you include that one in the middle. So if it happens, your brain doesn't feel like, oh my God, I haven't even thought about this possibility. Yeah, um, It's like, no, I've actually mentally prepared for this one too. Yeah, I'm being mounted and, yeah, you know, totally. and, and then I work my way out and come back. I think in theory, I mean, if you, <laughs> you've competed if you have this idea that you're going to go in and you imagine it's going to go brilliantly, it's not going to go that way. So you have to be ready for where it goes. Right. Or it might four yeah. times, but yeah. then not the but fifth then time. not the fifth. And uh, if you uh, – the, the, I think the best are either truly prepared for anything. I mean, you might break something. Your hand breaks. Is, mm -hmm. is the fight over? I can't win. Your I favor fought with two broken hands. The greats – will overcome anything. Mm -hmm. Us mortals may not always be able to, and even if we were able to, it would take an insane amount of learning and preparation and evolution to do it. The greats are already at, are at, got to that level through some other way, but you break your hand. Uh, all of a sudden, there's a groin shot. The, the, um, the, the mat tears, and it's an eight minute fix. Um, you get called, something changes. A, a, a guy parachutes into the ring. Do you remember that in mm -hmm. boxing? Yeah, a guy yeah. literally par anything. If you're truly prepared for anything, you can, you can handle it. Some guys are just able to prepare for anything, and some will visualize hundreds of variations and at least discuss it or, or plan for it or prepare for it. It's wild because no matter what happened, well, I mean, a guy parachuted in the ring, next thing I knew I was unconscious. Still your fault. Still, right. you must find your flaw in it. And this goes for everything in our life. If you get in a fight with your wife, you can easily go, well, I can't believe she did that. Or you can go, all she did was say something. Why did I react that way? That's on me. And you can adjust through studying for your for your role in anything. You can you can make that work. And the reason one of the cool things and why we study fighting is all of these things are lessons in any anyone's lives. Yeah, I mean, I, I, one of my favorite memories from my own fight, which didn't last very long, I got killed. Um, was, uh, you know, I didn't have a ground uh, background and I knew that, but I was 35 years old. I wanted this experience and I kept getting hurt and I, 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 I decided I'm just going to do it. Took it yeah. on my birthday. Went against a guy who was a ground specialist. I told all my friends, if this goes to the ground, I'm probably in trouble. <laughs> but for two months, I just practiced getting up, um, you know, sweeping from the mount. Yeah. yeah. Thinking, you know, maybe I'll just have one thing yeah. that I prepare for. Yeah. So anyway, you know, lo and behold, early on in the fight, he, you know, he ducks under a punch, takes me down, uh, gets to mount. And my first thought is I prepared for this. And at right. the time I had that thought, he had pushed me up against the cage. My back was against yeah. the cage. Shit, and I, I haven't thought, prepared for this. I haven't trained for this <laughs> one bit. Yeah. I have no idea how to yeah. get up with my back oh, against man. the cage. Yeah. I hear the ref, you know, say like, fight back. I'm like, oh yep. man, that's code for he's going to stop the fight. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I'm getting pounded in my face. But I did have the thought, however you get up from here, yeah. I bet it involves the hips. Yeah, and right. I had my brain yeah. scream yeah. to my body, yeah. hips. Yeah. And it's I got wild. him off for about a second or two. And, you know, then he hopped right back on and finished. Um, but I remember that feeling mm -hmm. that I was not panicked when he yeah. mounted because I'm like, I prepared yeah. for this. Yeah. Moment, yeah, right. My right. back was against the yeah. cage and I had realized I hadn't trained. I thought, I, I have no idea what to do. Yeah. Well, that's a bad place to be. So what you were seeking was the experience and what you really got out of it was the true experience of preparing 
dealing with the day before, dealing with the day of, dealing with the walkout, dealing with the first punch, dealing with being inter interviewed, dealing with losing. All of that is valuable knowledge for you. You work with other, with fighters. You, uh, all of that is now something you've tasted and smelled and felt. So that's, you, there's no comparison to that. And I have friends and other people I know that, that analyze fighting or do breakdowns or do things that, that I do. And every now and again, if it comes up, and whether it's me or uh, Elias Cepeda, who is a, a, a great writer who also has fought, or any of the guys that have, you, it's rude to say you need to fight to know this. It's rude, and I don't, and I try not to do it. But they'll sometimes go, well, it's not like you need to get in there. You absolutely do not need to get in there to talk about fighting. But how could it be a bad thing? How could yeah. it be a bad thing to have experienced that? You really, when people watch on TV, Chael Sonnen walking out to fight Anderson Silva, they they can try to imagine what that's like. But to feel the emotions, to feel the the body chemistry going on, it's it's trying to find the way to take fear or terror or excitement or some combination of you know po uh, positivity, any of those things, and and. And try to understand how to how to use them properly. It is a fascinating, fascinating. Yeah. I mean, thing. I remember the first time I cornered a fight. Uh, I was I was so nervous. Yeah. I was nervous before I actually <laughs> yeah. stepped in. And nobody's hitting you. Yeah, but you know, you're walking down. You, you yeah. know, just have the feeling of everyone you know looking at you, mm -hmm. and that you're going to have to know the right thing to say in about forty seconds worth of time in between the two rounds, mm -hmm. and you can communicate that well. Yeah. And, and like, you only have this, this much time. And he, he's, he's counting hearing, on me. Yeah, yes, exactly. he's going to be frenetic, but he's counting yeah. on me. I have to be there. I have to accurately yeah. see what's happening. Yeah. And, yeah, and so you have to be. I have to be calm. You have to be yeah. calm because I can't be, be frenetic and start yelling no. at him. It could freak him yeah. out. Yeah. So I remember telling, yeah. I need to fake it. It doesn't matter what. Yeah. I, but even that experience, you know, opened up my eyes a little mm. bit. You know, I only had the one fight, so you can I take away some lessons. But yeah. you can't, you know, you having uh, you know nine fights yeah. is, is and a, some. A lot I, more I had a couple of of kickboxing fights too, and uh, those. The experience, one, I, I, I won by body shots knockout and it was over. Oh, nice. That experience was amazing. But uh, I also fought when I was 19 years old in a bar in Selkirk, Manitoba. On the dance floor, they set up a ring. And, wow. uh, and uh, that was the one where I understood really just how real it was going to be. Because you're just a kid, you don't really know. And uh, I lost, but I went three rounds and it was very interesting. But those... Uh, I've had friends, somebody I was saying something about a judge, how judges, uh, uh, and I said something along the lines of, you know, guys who have never got in the, in the cage are not able to ju tr accurately judge damage. And I said this on Twitter to a friend of mine, and he's like, you don't have to fight to be able to know it. It's like, you don't. But once you do fight, you know how little you understood it before you did fight. You know, it's a, it's a really wild thing. And failure in there teaches you a ton. It really does because we're watching the best. You realize I'm nowhere near one of them. That makes you marvel all the more at what they're capable of when you've, you know, 99% of the world couldn't do that. You did it. And there's now another 99% to those guys, to Rich Franklin, who can go in yeah. and express himself comfortably every single night. You know? And it's a, it's a weird thing, you know, there's lots of things in life where people care about and they don't want to fail and failure feels mm -hmm. terrible. And then lots of people have had the experience of just being beat up in like the schoolyard and that feels terrible. Mm -hmm. And yet these guys, the, you know, they get both. If they yeah. fail, they fail at something that matters to them, that they have dreams invested in it, their futures invested in it, and they got beat up. And they're embarrassed maybe, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, you, you shouldn't be. Because if everybody in the audience understood what you did to get there, what right. you did to walk in there, what you, all of that, you wouldn't be. But you know those people don't understand that. And some people will boo a fighter, boo him and, uh, and say you're a bum and stuff to a guy who l loses on an undercard in Australia. And that's just so tragic to me. But yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Um, it is too bad, and it's you know, and it's not even just that they stepped in there and put themselves on the line physically and mentally, but the you know the training it took to get there mm -hmm. is training that most people just can't yeah. can't deal with, couldn't couldn't put up with. Yeah. So it's, it's a lifestyle, that, uh, not not just the night. That's the other thing when you see somebody sort of you know it ends and they just couldn't do it. God, they got so far because you can quit in your first day of jiu-jitsu. You can quit at the third year and you can quit in your first jiu-jitsu tournament. You can quit when the diet gets there and you can – there's so many – there's thousands and thousands of steps 
at which you can fail. So by the time you fail in Australia on an undercard in front of a half empty house, you've succeeded 9,999 times to go far enough. It's just at that level you can't. It's a wild thing. Yeah, and sometimes I think people, when they finally succeed, can actually lose a little bit of the mental edge. And I wonder mm -hmm. if that happened with Hendrix a little bit. Mm -hmm. He wanted that belt so badly mm -hmm. and he almost got it against GSP and arguably yeah. deserved it. And then he finally got it and you know, I don't have any inside knowledge about him, but to my eye, when he was fighting Lawler the second mm -hmm. time, when he actually had the belt mm -hmm. and Lawler wanted it, I thought Hendrix had this expression right as the fight was about to begin. All right, so we're going to touch gloves and more or less yeah. do the same thing. Yeah. And Lawler was it's like, like, I'm going to murder you. Like, I'm going to murder you. <laughs> yeah. And Hendrix did not look yeah. ready. And it was in, you know, that could be tough. Your whole life is for this goal and you get it. Yeah. And now suddenly you need a new goal, which is to keep it. And people can yeah. say, well, you know, I have this new goal, but it's, you don't necessarily have the same fire. And every time you train, I need, you know, the urgency to, mm -hmm. to make this count. And that can happen For sure. too. The, um, the new goal to keep it, that goes back to what we were saying about George and Anderson. That is a very challenging goal, I think, because there's all these wolves underneath you on the hill. You're on the top. You're eating, you're having sex with all the other female wolves and stuff, and all these hungry wolves, they'll do anything to right. get up there. They're, they're desperate. They're, they have a ravenous desperation to get there. Then one of them eventually knocks you off. Now they're there. They start becoming the fat wolf. They start having all the wolf bitches, you know? And then there's some other guys coming around. And when, when George was talking at the top about he, the target on his back and he can't handle it anymore, he was honest. And honesty is mm -hmm. very rare today. Mm -hmm. I think... Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. I think it's important to becoming good at anything, including fighting. But I think honesty is something we've all kind of forgotten its importance. But George was honest. He's like, I don't know how long I can handle that. And Johnny, almost at the top, was like, I want that target on my back. I want everybody gunning for me. I want that. Well, he had it for one minute. He had it for one fight. And then he really understood. And I once called Johnny a fat jerk or something on TV. Uh, when he missed weight, I was kind of... A lot. I'm, I happen to talk on television, but a lot of people close to fighting have zero tolerance for missing weight and believe that part of the penalty for missing weight, I'm going to take 20% of your purse and you're going to suffer public ridicule. It's mm -hmm. always been part of the deal. Mm -hmm. But it, that seemed to be viewed by a lot of people and get shared around. So if Johnny Hendricks heard me call him a fat jerk, he probably wouldn't be all that excited to talk to me, which sucks, because I'd like to really honestly ask him about that experience, mm -hmm. getting to the top of that hill and what it really felt like to be there, to really that moment when Lawler's looking at you like, I'm the fucking wolf now, you know, what that really, if he could put into words what right. that experience was really about. And, that, and there's this weird way in which, let's say it's true that once he reached there, he lost some of his fire, but he wants to keep fighting. It actually might benefit him in this case to not allow himself to feel that, uh, to somehow, that's an interesting one, because I completely agree that being honest and accurate with your own self-assessments mm -hmm. is, is key to being a champion, key to being mentally great. And yet this one gives me pause where if it's really true that he lost some of that hunger, it might be better if he doesn't allow himself to, to feel that. <laughs> Well, he's going to keep fighting. I mean, I guess the counterpoint is But if is you that, do recognize it, you right, can do you something do, about it. Right. Could, or you can say, I shouldn't be here. I'm going to take right, brain damage. Right, right. And, and, you know? Yeah. I, I truly, I can't think of a, of a situation that honesty wouldn't, with yourself wouldn't be the best choice. I think it's pretty rare. I, I, so this came up in some pod podcast I was doing recently. What about um, cornering advice in between yeah. rounds? And I was thinking... Honesty you know, with yourself, not necessarily honesty with your gotcha, fighter. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. yeah. Actually, that's a yeah. key distinction. Yeah. Because yeah. I was thinking the corner man should be honest 99% of the time. Yeah. There probably are cases where you want to mm -hmm. be a little less than honest. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, because we need to shape... We need to frame the fight for you. Right. And if you're getting a shit kicking, it's like, coach, I'm getting a shit kicking. Yeah. Turns that's, out he's better than we thought. That is true. <laughs> yeah. But... You've taken his worst. You're now in a situation, this is what we train for. You have the chance here to go out and just really overcome something immense. Right. All that stuff is still true, but we've reframed right. it for you. Instead of like, oh my God, I'm gonna get a five minutes more of a shit kicking or really get hurt bad. It's like, these are the moments where, where greatness is discovered. These are the right. moments where you will tell your friends and your family and your children forever if you overcome this. And if you can't, I'm gonna throw this towel in and protect you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think sometimes you realize like we're not as prepared as we thought or they're more mm -hmm. prepared, but you still, as a coach, you know, as a cornerman, will have an idea that 
but there is a 10% chance we can win this way. Mm. And, right. and you want to communicate that to your person. Here's what's open. Yeah. Here's what you yeah. should be looking for. Yeah. Now, you don't want to tell them there's about a 10% yeah. chance yeah. this will work. So I think right. that you can hold back. True. But, you know, you, I think even when your person's getting beat, you have a vision. It's pro- our chances of winning are probably greater than zero. And maybe the most we can get him to is 10%, but it would be by keeping distance. And then mm-hmm. at the right moment when he's going, yeah. he's going for this, you do this. Yeah. And so you want to communicate that in a confident, excited for way. Sure. That would be a little less than honest. You said your person. Have you cornered a woman ever? Uh, no. No. Uh, so I've, I've thought about this, the psychology of – we see some crazy fights with women. And yes, some of the skill level hasn't yet matched the men. And that's true mm-hmm. in women's basketball and other things. It's also – the physicality is different. But you see there's a real ferocity. And remember I was just saying you get – there's a thousand ways you could stop – fighting all the way up to undercard of the UFC. Mm -hmm. Now, there's going to be a thousand more fighting all the way up to seeking a championship, but you could have stopped day one, day 25, the first time you sparred, when you diet, there's thousands. I think with women, by the time they get to fighting, there's hundreds of thousands because there's additional challenges that they face. You know, ridicule and discouragement, their family saying, what the hell? All of these additional things that they have to overcome. Yes, there's, there's a smaller pool, so maybe you don't have as many fights, but I think psychologically, there are more societal and cultural challenges for a woman to take that route all the way up to fighting. Yeah, no question. So then, you know, you wonder if that translates into meaning that the women who are there exactly. have this sort of extra mental exactly. toughness, this extra focus. Yeah, I think that's the case. I mean, if there's a thousand times for you to not get there, for you to just go, you know what, cake is way better than this. Um, going out and getting drunk with my friends is way better than this. You know, not getting hit in the head is better. There's a million. There's, there's thousands. They have even more. So they have to overcome even more to get there, at least culturally, at least family, at least all those kinds of things. So I think you end up with a certain with a certain amount of there were so many chances that you could have bailed. And that's why Amisha Tate ends up in that fight down to that last second. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That was an incredible fight. And I don't, know, I don't know if it's just like a recency effect, but that might be, from my perspective, the greatest women's fight there's been. Because most women's fights, even when they're exciting, there's often some element of a mismatch mm-hmm. um, or it's, it's limited in some way by the skill sets involved. And sure, Holly Holm has, has a lot more room to grow because she's relatively new to MMA. But you know, we saw true, truly elite women actually perform at their best Mm -hmm. or close to it. It wasn't like they were making dumb mistakes. They were doing things right physically. They were implementing their game plans right. Both of them were implementing smart game plans correctly. And we saw- All the way down the line. And we saw one champion beat another champion. And they both fought like champions. And it's, I don't know that there's that many women's fights where we can, you know, truly, truly say that. One of the things that is interesting about the, where women fighting is, is you know, and when I say the skill level has developed at a different speed, that's the truth. Mm-hmm. That's not some, you know, uh, um, uh, bias against gender or something. That is yeah, analytical. Just, just the way it happens, yeah, yeah, that's analytical truth. But what makes that interesting is we are ten years ago in the way that they're putting their skills together. Ronda Rousey was Hoist Gracie. And she was beaten by a striker. It was literally a grappler versus a striker. She couldn't grapple, so she got the shit kicked out of her. Then she fought Misha Tate, who was kind of an adapted grappler who could strike just enough mm-hmm. to stay in there and beat the striker. Joanna Janjaychuk is Chuck Liddell. She's Chuck Liddell. She just sprawls and brawls. Old school. That can't, Those expressions of how those fights happened do not they happen on undercards all the time where you and i fought that happens all the time but at the high level of evolution if you ever hear somebody and i mean yes i i know that joe or goldie or or brian stan any of these and they're they're the ones i named are my very favorite they will sometimes say yeah you know styles make fights it's a grappler versus a striker i think they're saying that just to make it easy the story because the truth is there's no such thing at the top level there that just doesn't exist but in in women's fighting joanna jenche checks chocolate out <laughs> like right, you can't right. take me down. If you do, I'll get back up. I'm going to drill you with my right hand. So some of the more you know simplified narratives are actually more, are, a little more accurate. Are more accurate. Um, yeah, I think. I think so. So what else? We got 10, uh, 15 more minutes. We still haven't talked about our book. It is. We are going to work on it in May for sure. 
That's what. Or I mean, maybe. Well, you've like, been crazy busy. I've been crazy busy this term. But for me, my calendar opens up in May, and you know, yeah. I'm, I'm an academic. We do most of our writing in the summer. Yeah. So I've I've learned I can't make any guarantees. Yeah. I feel like most of my <laughs> most of my favorite know. you know research projects or papers or books you know they happen three years after I decide to do them. So well, and that's what's happening with yeah. this. And I'm not. Yeah. If that happens with this, that'll be a success. But yeah, maybe some writing will happen you, come May. Yeah, and I mean we're working out some of these ideas. It's taking shape. The breakdowns happen that way too. Ideas float around and then get a little more focused and then they happen. Um, but I like, I mean, I like hanging out with you. We hung out for three, eight, four hours last night. Uh, but I like doing it with a camera because I think that we're talking about honesty. Mm -hmm. We have some viewers that watch Fight Network, so we'll probably clue people into our project a little more with this one. But even when we do it, I think the idea of being honest with people is what a podcast is supposed to be. Literally work things out in real time. Television used to be this thing where a producer would schedule out everything, they put you in a thing, they set right. you on a table, and you would say a bunch of rehearsed stuff. But the idea of in real time, the challenges of writing a book, the challenges of gathering information, all this stuff is stuff everybody deals with, whatever they do in, the, in their life. And I always like that, being able to share with people, and people are like, oh yeah, I do stuff like that. Oh, yeah, that applies to me. You know, I, I, somehow that feels important to me. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can't put the actual writing process because that probably, that might be too boring. Literally yeah, yeah. seeing <laughs> words <laughs> of the computer. Oh, wait, let's move this around yeah. here. Oh, maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah. But, yeah, it is nice to be able to share some of it. And, yeah. I mean, I did come into this t with too much of an academic perspective thinking, well, all we have to do first is identify all the different mental elements mm -hmm. and then put them into the right order and write about them. <laughs> right. And there's just a million ways to cut up the mental world. You can't just say what the elements are and then you come up with this element, but really that's really three. And yeah. Um, so, you know, I really like that we slash you came up with the idea um, one or two podcasts ago to – Break it up by anecdote. Pick some yeah. of our favorite fights or favorite moments that illustrate a cool, you know, a really cool principle or two and just have a book around a bunch of anecdotes. Problem is, is every time I think I know what the key ane you know, anecdotes are to put in, oh, fights keep happening. And then we have more amazing examples. And, I know. And it's, it's the same it's thing with the technical breakdown. So we're what we're looking for. And whether I'm doing my, my breakdowns for the UFC or for Fight Network or what we're looking for here mentally is we're looking to take something – that it, uh, first we have to understand something and you have a PhD in this topic and I study from the perspective that I study. I think we're learning to understand it. Then the, the fact is we, you have to take complex ideas and present them in bite-sized ways. That's the art of being right. able to share information to me. And so breakdowns and analysis got for me uh, and I'm using it just as a comparison because I think the mental works frames up the same way as talking about punches and kicks and stuff in a lot of ways. It got more and more complicated. When this happens, this guy can do this, look here, right. this means that. Gets so complicated and then moments happen where you start to focus in and you can simplify it. And that's what I'm trying to do with breakdowns now. My breakdowns have no motivation to say, look, I know a bunch of stuff about fighting. And I do, I know that some, sometimes that could be something somebody would want to do. Mine is, I have no bearing in this. I get to wear a cool suit and jump around and that is really fun and I right. like it. But it's not about what I know. The, I'm looking for just truths and facts and find an entertaining way to share them so people can get them. And I think the, the, psych, the psychology and the mentality stuff has to be the same, same way. We're, we're looking, we're seeing all these very complex ideas and we're working them out. We work them out when we chat, we, they make, we make sense of them, but then we have to simplify them. And I think that's the challenge of the book. And I think because you're a PhD in psychology, you can tell us facts, studied, accepted scientific facts about psychology, and you can transfer them over to fighting. And that's cool. You could do that right now. But we need to do it in a way that makes sense when Demetrius Johnson and Henry Ceuto walk in there because you're not writing it for other psychologists. We're writing right. it for fight fans. Right. And it, I mean, and it has to be accurate. You know, it so has to be I real. Would, I, would, I would want to do this. Like, let's say you weren't interested or, you know, we hadn't met. I would want to do this on my own. But anything I would write, I would feel some combination of, I think this is too important, but I might be wrong because right. I'm... I have some expertise in martial arts, but I don't have your expertise. So one of my favorite things is when I share something with you, right? I, I think this is true. I think this yeah. is what happened. Or I think this is you know how this shaped up. 
uh, but I don't know what you're going to say. And then when, when you say, oh, I said, you know, I, yeah. I see it the same way. I'm thinking, oh, wow, yeah. we're on to something yeah. here. The, that's – so I, I, I do get asked that about this job and what we do. The, the discovering truths is the whole point. And there are times where this happened, you're sure it happened, you look at it in seven different ways and it happened, you look at the science and it happened, you look at the physiology and it happened, you talk about that, you work it out with somebody else, and then you're like, holy shit, that's the truth of this situation. Mm -hmm. And that's the goal. That's the goal of what we're doing with mentality, that's the goal of what I do with the breakdowns. You're looking for the truth. If you're not looking for the truth and you're trying to say, hey, look at this cool, neat thing, and look, I'm the guy who, who brought it to you, you can literally make up any bullshit about fighting. This right. thing happened because he slipped his head here and when he spied that, none of that is happening. It's happening, yeah. we need the truth of what's happening. Definitely. The, the crazy thing about science and what you've spent a lifetime studying is the truth is only the truth, and this is scary, but exciting. It's only the truth right now because that truth, as we gain more information, will get a new color to it. And that's that scares a lot of people about science. but. Ronda Rousey is mentally strong. Ronda Rousey can mm -hmm. overcome in 2014. And Ronda Rousey in 2016, between the pressure she had, mm -hmm. the, the way that she experienced things, what she dealt with in a fight, the way the world has changed, the influence culturally, the way her life has changed, the way her perspective has changed, that may not be true now. And that yeah. is exciting, but it's scary. It is exciting. And and then, you, you know, it makes me immediately think about, well, if I imagine what her, her mindset might be. And she, she's enough in the public limelight that there's some data to go mm -hmm. on, although it's not yep. perfect. What would have to be different for her to actually go into to fight Holly Holm with confidence? Yeah. And I think it would have to be some version of her being able to genuinely believe I'm a different fighter with a different skill set, yep. meaning that she has to train with somebody else. Yep. Um, not just for you know, technical reasons, yeah. although that too, yeah. but to then really feel like I am a new fighter. I'm yeah. not just the same version who's more ready mm -hmm. this time because th that, that could yeah. start feeling like maybe it's not enough. Well, that already failed her. I'm right. Ronda Rousey, I will overcome already failed once. So right. We need to build a new Ronda Rousey. What, of the many influences, and this may be true of Conor McGregor too. I, somebody showed me a little footage of him drunk somewhere in, in Vegas in his house. Yeah, and I literally just spied it over somebody's shoulder today. Um, now, you just lost a fight, you're worth $10 million, your world has changed, wouldn't be a bad idea to get a little hammered, you know, but, and, you know, reset next Monday. But, you know, that's a one moment in time. What's Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday? We don't know, right? right. But yeah. regardless, so this might apply to him too. You know, those, there's anecdotes in movies that make sense, old martial arts movies, even Rocky movies, that make sense because they're true forever. You want to fight your master. T.J. Dillashaw wants to fight your IFA, but these are true, eternal stories of combat. And Rocky going out to Siberia in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, the middle of nowhere, there's none of <laughs> throwing it around, too much caffeine. There's none of this. There's no internet. There's no haters. There's no TV. There's no red carpets. There's no shaving. You're just fighting and there's nothing. Yeah. Conor McGregor was as successful as he was. He said it. His own words are some of the best evidence we can use, although some of them are meant for public. Some of them are meant as lies to influence your opponents. You can't trust all the words. But he's not special. He's not, there's no such thing as talent. He just outworked everybody. He, it is the work that did it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? We're not getting hammered in Vegas. We're not talking on television. We're not doing any of this shit. We're going in the middle of nowhere and we're going to work harder than we've ever worked in our lives. With the best work, focused work. Um, and if we do that and fail, well, then we've done everything. If we're walking a red carpet where we should be wrestling, we haven't done everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, and he also, I don't, it might be hard to simulate, but I mean, what he could really use is an experience where he's really getting beaten and then comes back and wins. Yeah. You know, if you sort of look at his repertoire of how he can win so far, I mean, and it's amazing, you know, in, in recent history, mm -hmm. he prepares, he visualizes, yeah. he is the right perspective on how this is going to go and then he makes it happen yeah. and, you know, it happens yeah. and it's just incredible. But now suddenly that's failed him. He visualized his, his what he visualized yeah. was probably more or less what was yeah. happening in the first round, but then it hit a roadblock. Yeah, right. And in his words, you know, uh, Diaz went on autopilot and he panicked. Yeah, he went and into so panic mode. How is he going to be prepared to not panic the next time? And it might, you know, so one perspective is get better, don't even get to the point where I have to panic. Yeah. But another 
perspective is, is in some ways prepare for that situation too. And logically and, the best is do both. Definitely, definitely. You know, because whether it's the next fight or, and that's what I was saying about his concept of eternal growth. It's very inspiring because, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is you do, you can get better at it. That's a fact. You know, there are many examples of that everywhere you look. It's one of the reasons we love fighting. You can look for it in anything. Um, so that's great. It's very inspiring. But okay, I'm going to fight RDA. Oh, I beat him. Great. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's fight Robbie Lawler. Okay. You're not going to beat Robbie Lawler. Oh, shit. He blew out his knee and I won. Is Luke Rockhold now? Like, is it Luke Rockhold? Right. He slipped on a banana peel. Okay. Now it's John Jones. Like, it eventually, there are limits. The right. reality right. that the, the being limitless is a great concept. But you also need to temper it totally with reality honest, or right? you're going to, totally you know, yeah, yeah, it's not true. It's a great idea. It's a great philosophy, but a philosophy of eternal growth is not ever been true. So we have to still temper it with, with reality and honesty. Honesty is powerful. You know. Yeah, that's a great, maybe a great concept to end on. Yeah, I, I think I so. Think we're running out of time. I yes. Could, I could talk all day, but. Yeah, I know, me too. There's a bit of a schedule. Chase is texting us and this booth is being used by others. Uh, so, but it was fun, man. It was very fun. So we'll, we will make, and I'm going to try to find a way to connect anybody who has, is watching this with what we'll do over Google Hangout uh, going forward so that we can keep working on this. Essentially, we um, hung out shared some great ideas, made us both think, and accomplished nothing on our book again. <laughs> no, not I nothing. Know about that. I, I know. I think when it comes time yeah. to write in May, yeah. there's going to be a moment where all these conversations, and it's going to feel like, you know what? This is yeah. ready to actually happen now. You know what's interesting about that? We talked about, you know, whoever, Rhonda, Connor, whoever's mm -hmm. uh, work. My process has been, for the last couple of years, consume as much information as possible. Have as much exchange as possible mm -hmm. and when it's time to go you've got so much to choose from the job becomes right. filtering through it and i think a lot of people in the world whatever it is they do we're in a state where we can consume large amounts of information so i think you're absolutely right every single time we explore this a little deeper is progress on the book the fact that we haven't typed a letter um hello or whatever or the first letter of the thing is not that isn't you know and that isn't a fact because the work is being done. And as long as the work is being done, you're getting better. Yeah, a as lot of the stuff I've written, I ended up writing very fast, but it's not that I could have sat down and done it any time. It's that I was excited about it and thinking about it for a long time. And yeah. then suddenly one day when I had some open time and the laptop in front of me, I thought, huh, I think yeah. this is ready to write. Yeah. So I think that'll happen. Yeah, I think we're there. And I'm working on a John Jones Cormier piece right now. And it's using concepts that I've been working on for over a year. You know, and it's time to do nice. it now. So, anyways, thanks, oh, man. Uh, it's David Klonsky MMA uh, Klonsky on Twitter. MMA. Klonsky MMA on Twitter, uh, and follow David and I'm Robin Black MMA on Twitter. And uh, it's been fun. I'm going to try to find ways that if you uh, have enjoyed our chat, that you can follow our ongoing work of 90% mental on Google Hangouts. Thanks a lot, you guys.